What made the story simply chilling, though, was the revelation that Carol had hadn't acted alone. Two teenagers from the Heights admitted to the police that Carol had recruited them to be his assistants. 17-year-old Wayne Henley, a wiry kid with acne on his cheeks and thick brown hair, and an 18-year-old David Brooks, an eccentric-looking, blonde-haired youth who wore wire-rimmed glasses. They said they had lured boys into Carol's Plymouth GTX muscle car or his white van, asking if they needed a ride or if they wanted to go drink a beer. After taking the boys to one of Carol's apartments or rented houses, Carol was constantly moving, sometimes staying in one place for only a few weeks. Henley and Brooks would help Carol strip them nude, tape their mouths, bind their hands and legs, and fasten them with handcuffs to a sheet of plywood that was two and a half feet wide and eight feet long. Often they forced the boys to write a letter to their parents or sometimes even call them, letting them know that they were okay and would be back soon. Carol would go to work, pulling out the boys' pubic hairs, inserting thin glass rods into their private areas, or sticking large rubber D's into the rectum. Dean would mess with all of them and sometimes force oral on them and force them to have oral with him. Henley said in his confession, then he would unalive them. In their confessions, Henley and Brooks mentioned the names of many of the teenagers they had helped unalive, several of whom were friends, including Henley's longtime buddy, Mark Scott. They admitted they helped Carol carry the bodies to his car or van, and they helped bury them in one of his private cemeteries. One morning, Brooks said in his confession, he and Henley spent a few hours fishing at Sam Rayburn Reservoir before pulling out an unalive boy out of Carol's van and digging him a grave. Although the two teenagers were the products of what were then called broken homes, their parents were divorced, and they had dropped out of school. They were hardly regarded around the Heights as troublemakers. Not one person who knew who knew the teenagers understood how they could have turned so quickly into vicious sadists, willing to do Carol's monstrous bidding. The most flabbergasting aspect of the entire story, however, is that it is almost completely forgotten today. Although two books about the murders were hastily published, they didn't stay on shelves for long. After being hospitalized supposedly for the pulmonary condition, Capote dropped his project altogether, perhaps because the newspapers could find only a handful of grainy black and white photographs of Carol. He never gave an interview, of course. The public soon became fixated on the more media-accessible killers who followed him, like Ted Bundy, who crisscrossed the country in the mid-70s, bludgeoning and strangling women to death. David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, who confessed to shooting six people in New York in 1976 and 1977. John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown who broke Carol's record when he murdered 33 Chicago area boys between 1972 and 1978. Even today in the Heights, where a new generation of professionals have arrived to renovate the old frame bungalows or tear them down entirely to build their own townhomes, yoga studios, and pet lodges. Almost nothing is known about Carol and his two teenage assistants. There are no plaques or memorials to honor the boys who were murdered. Some of the current residents who have actually heard about the trio's rampage assume it's just nothing more than a bizarre urban legend that began and ended during the Nixon administration. Yet, at least in this case, the past is hardly past. From around the country, aging parents who do not know how to use email still send handwritten letters to the Harris County Institute of Forensic Science, the former medical examiner's office, wanting to know if their sons, who went missing in the early 70s, might be buried in one of Carol's cemeteries. They ask if there is any new information about the handful of bodies from the killings that have never been identified.
other parents who learned from Brooks and Henley's confessions that their sons had been murdered remain convinced that they were given the wrong remains and buried someone else's child. One of those parents is Mrs. Scott, who has never known for sure what happened to Mark's body. I've always wanted to know if he was in his proper resting place, she said. In September, as she finished feeding her doves, throwing an extra handful of birdseed to Mrs. Whitney. Then less than a month later, her doorbell rang, standing on the stoop, wearing scrubs and holding a pouch that contained a DNA kit, was a woman who introduced herself as Sharon Derrick, a forensic anthropologist from the Institute of Forensic Science. Mrs. Scott escorted Derrick into the living room. I want to try to help you, Derrick said. For a long time, the frail white-haired widow said nothing. Then she put her hands over her eyes so that Derek couldn't see her tears. My 14-year-old niece came to visit me the other day, says Wayne Henley, sitting in the visiting area of Texas Department of Criminal Justice Michael Unit in Tennessee Colony outside Palestine. She asked me if I really had done all the things that had, she had been reading about on the internet. I looked at her and said, honey, I wish I could explain it to you. He's now 54 years old five feet five inches tall about 150 pounds his hair is thinning and he wears reading glasses he's been up since five o'clock working his shift at the prison laundry and dabbling on a painting of a landscape dotted with pine trees in the craft shop i try to keep myself busy and i try not to sleep much he says i don't like dreaming about the old days in 1974 henley received a life sentence for his role in the murders a year later, David Brooks got his own life sentence and was sent to the Ramsey unit south of Houston. Brooks, who still has a touch of blonde in his now closely cropped hair, has never spoken publicly since giving his confession. I sent him a letter once asking how he was doing, says Henley. He wrote back. He typed his letter and didn't sign it, saying, let's stay in touch. But we never did. I mean, in the end, what were we going to say to each other? how we wished we had never met Dean. In the mid-60s, in the mid-60s, when he was either 10 or 11 years old, Brooks stopped at the Corral Candy Factory, a small warehouse with an office in front and a loading dock in back, which was just across the street from his elementary school. David's parents were divorced, his mother was in Beaumont, and David was living alone with his father, Alton a very tough redneck paving contractor, says Brooks, former attorney, Jim Skelton, who's still practicing in Houston. I don't think Alton really liked David at all that much because he was a sickly kid who wore his hippie glasses. And here came Dean, who didn't call him a sissy. David idolized him. He told me that Dean was the first adult male who didn't make fun of him. Raised in Indiana and in Tennessee, Terrell had come to Texas with his mother and siblings when he was 16. In 1962, the family moved to the Heights so his mother could open her candy factory, which specialized in divinity, pralines, and pecan shoes. Carol ran the assembly line, and in his free time, he not only handed out candy to the kids, but he invited them to the back room in the factory where he had set up a pool table. He gave the kids rides on his motorcycle, and he outfitted his van with cushions, carpets, and a television set so he could take them to picnics at the beach. As far as Hyatt's parents were concerned, Carol was a perfect gentleman. They regarded his fondness for children to be no more different from that they would find in the respectable uh, scoutmaster. One day, a kid named Mally Wrinkle told his mother, Selma, that he had been given a job sweeping up pecan scraps and peeling caramels off the floor at the factory. Selma was divorced and worked nights. Nurse's aide checked out the factory herself and was so taken by Carol that she accepted his offer to work part-time in the afternoons. No one adored Carol more than his petite blue-eyed mother, Mary, who was known around the Heights both for her entrepreneurial skills and her fondness for marriage. She had twice married and divorced Carol's father, who lived in Pasadena, 
where he worked as an electrician. Then she had married and divorced a salesman. Later, she had impulsively married a merchant seaman she had met through a newly opened Houston computer dating service. She filled out a questionnaire. She filled out a questionnaire. Her answers were then fed into a giant mainframe computer, and after several days, the computer produced a list of potential dates for her based on other applicants' questionnaires. Perhaps the reason Mary was so unlucky in love was because no man was as important to her as her son, whom she depended on to run the candy factory. Carell, in turn, loved pleasing her. In 1965, he successfully applied for a hardship discharge from the Army, where he had compiled a record in the radio repair school at Fort Hood because he said his mother needed him back home. At one point, Mary's third husband, the merchant seaman, told his wife that he suspected Carol might be homosexual because of the number of young boys he invited over to the candy factory after hours. She refused to believe it, later telling a reporter for the Houston Post that her son was loyal, obedient, helpful, loving, and a good, normal boy. His one problem, she said, was that he was the kind of person who never wanted to get close enough to anyone so they could get ties on him. He had seen so many broken marriages. True to form, she divorced the merchant seaman in 1968 and based on her visits to Houston psychics, who told her that she needed to get as far away from him as possible. She closed the candy factory and moved to Colorado. No doubt, to his mother's surprise, Carol told her that he would be staying. He got a job working as an electrician at the Houston Lighting and Power Company, and by 1970, he had moved to an apartment about five miles southwest of the Heights, Yorkton Street. The apartment was located a few blocks from the Galleria, a 600,000-square-foot indoor luxury shopping mall, complete with an ice skating ring in the center and Neiman Marcus as its anchor that was preparing to open in November. It was a giddy time in Houston. Boosters were calling the city the future of the United States. Over at the Texas Medical Center, rival surgeons Denton Cooley and Michael DeBakey pioneering heart transplant surgery at the NASA's giant manned space flight center. Flight directors were guiding Apollo astronauts to the moon. The Astrodome, which had opened in 1965, was still being called the eighth wonder of the world. People were flooding into Houston. The population rapidly approached two million, and the apartments around the Galleria were swarming with single people hoping to someday make their mark on the world. Living less than a mile from the Carroll in the snazzy Chateau de Jean apartment complex, which offered six swimming pools and all-day water volleyball, Games was the well-known Houston bachelor, George W. Bush, who was then driving a triumphant sports car, chasing women in flying jets for the Texas Air National Guard. But Carroll wasn't exactly like his neighbors. At some point after his mother left Houston, he decided to embrace a compulsion he had apparently kept secret for years. He began inviting teenage boys over to his apartment, some of whom he had been eyeing since his days at the candy factory. One of those boys was David Brooks. After he arrived, Carol persuaded him to pull down his pants, at which point Carol dropped his dropped to his knees and per, began performing what the Texas criminal statutes at the time called oral sodomy. According to those who knew Brooks, the introspective young teenager was not gay. In fact, he had a girlfriend who lived in the Heights. But you have to understand that Dean had become David's father figure says Brooks, attorney Skelton. He had taken care of him, given him money when he needed it, and let him stay with him whenever David needed to get away from his real father. You know, a man like that can have a lot of influence over a young, insecure boy. It wasn't long, though, before Brooks realized that Carol was driven by much darker needs. In mid-December, Brooks, who was, the 15, who was 15, walked unannounced into Carol's apartment. In the confession he gave police two and a half years later, he said he saw two naked boys tied to Carol's bed. Carol also naked was molesting them. 
What are you doing here? Carol snapped, and Brooks turned around and left. Later, he said Carol told him that he was part of a gay pornography ring and that he had been paid to send those boys out to California to pose for photos. At some point, Brooks said Carol changed his story and told Brooks he had unalived the boys and buried them in his storage shed.